He paid for all of the sins, for all of the people, for all of time. You know, it doesn't take a double doctoral or a master's work. I'm not poking fun at anybody. Be who God created you to be, please. It always boils down to our relationship with Jesus. That, it, that relationship affects everything in our lives. God chose Israel. Our founding fathers chose God. Be a doer of the word. Because faith without works is dead, for real. That's religion, that's knowledge, that's intellect. You need to go out there and engage with your world and own your liberty. All right, so on Q&A Sunday, we're already in a mess because of how we started. And just prior, just prior to going to the folks that have questions here in the room, I do need to do one question that came in online because it came in four months ago and I haven't answered it or we haven't answered it. And so I wanna do this and I think this has a ton of validity because of the kind of the overview that we're gonna put on this. So this person's question is, would you please explain these two scriptures? They seem to be in contradiction, not in sync with each other, but since this is the word of God, they obviously have merit. And this is Proverbs chapter 26, verses four and five. And I don't know if you can put them um, like on one slide so that people can see the potential of contradiction. <clears throat> Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he become wise in his own eyes. What the what? <laughs> you know, it'd be, it'd be one thing like if it was like Proverbs chapter 10, verse 7, and then Proverbs 26, verse... But these are back to back. And I've been, I've been wanting to minister into this for quite some time because I really don't think that people understand the different types of language that the Bible has. There's prophetic language, there's apocalyptic language, there's proverbial language, there's poetic language, there's uh, parabolic language, there's allegory, there's... Uh, there's, there's illusionary, there's, there's spiritual language. There, the Bible is not just some book where you pick it up and you get your verse and you're like, oh, okay, that's what I'm supposed to do. Like the, the checklist of the, of the sheet of paper that you got in your brand new TV. Turn it on, step one. It, it doesn't work that way. The Bible doesn't do direct theology. It does indirect theology. And that's why the only way to get it is by the Spirit of God. He wrote it. If you read what the Spirit of God wrote, and you read it through your human intellect, you're going to end up being dumbfounded by a majority of it. A majority. Trust me, I know. I was dumbfounded a lot. Every once in a while, I still got a little dumb. My mom was the first one to laugh. <laughs> Ouch. So I want to explain Proverbs. This is important. Proverbs are basically best practices. These are wise people that have, under the unction of the Spirit, were sharing their wisdom, their experiences, their knowledge with us. And obviously, because the Holy Spirit was involved, that means that that wisdom was approved. And best practices are not promises. Proverbs are not promises. And I, and I need that to sit in because I've heard a lot of people quote their favorite proverb as a promise. It's not. Now, the Holy Spirit can quicken something to you, 
And you can be believing that operating in that wisdom that that proverb gives you is going to give you a likelihood of great success. I completely agree. Raise a child up in the way that they should go, and when they're old, they'll not depart from it. That's a proverb. That's a best practice. It is very, very likely that if you raise a child the right way, they're going to end up right. It is very, very likely. If you don't, they won't. And you have examples of both. You also have examples of the reverse. You know someone that grew up in a terrible, terrible home. Bad, wicked parents or no parents. And they turned out to be one of the most amazing people you ever met. And you know people that grew up in one of the most godly homes ever. Loving mother, great father, did everything they could to raise them right. And they went wheels off into the gates of hell, hair on fire, helter-skelter. Best practices. There's always going to be asterisks to best practices. So what do you do? Throw the book of Proverbs out? No! You engage with as many of the best practices that you possibly can because you are going to have a way greater likelihood of those things turning out successfully in your life. So in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 19... So that your trust may be in the Lord, I instruct you today, yes, you. The purpose of the Proverbs is for you to put trust, trust is a big word, trust in the Lord, not trust in the proverb. The best practice without the power of the Spirit is just a best practice. But with the power of the Spirit, now you have a way greater likelihood of accomplishing great things in the kingdom. Specifically for your life, for your future, for your family. There is tons of parenting in the Proverbs. And any of you that are parents, you know that you can parent well and end up with some children that need to have their necks broke in the Spirit. Can I say that? <laughs> and sometimes you just have that kid that no matter how badly a parent, they're just like, ah, it's okay, I'll figure it out. You know who has, what parent has the most wayward, rebellious children ever? God. If it was only about perfect parenting, man, I hope some of you hear this. If it was only about perfect parenting, then every child of God would be perfect. And as I scan this crowd, we could probably all surmise that maybe it's not the perfect parenting of the father. That's caused some of you, I mean, not you, out there in YouTube land, you. Maybe some of you are just making bad choices because you wanna. I don't care what God says. And I know you, you think like that's totally okay when you're faced with the circumstance, but if you see some three-year-old kid do that to their parent, you're like, hey, you, listen to your parents. I don't wanna. I will Make a connection with your gluteus maximus and your cerebral cortex <laughs> with a wooden object multiple times. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6. The Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come understanding and knowledge and understanding. So the Lord gives wisdom. But the only way for you to have the ability to do anything with that wisdom is that his mouth, intimacy with him, is required for you to turn wisdom into knowledge and understanding. You know, I could give you all the wisdom in the world. I could write it down, hand it to you. But if you don't understand, if you don't have knowledge of how to appropriate that wisdom in your life, it's 
frustrating. You know how many people get frustrated when I preach on things like the stripe, by the stripes of Jesus you're healed? And then they're like, well, I don't feel it. I still got symptoms. The doctor said I got the thing. So you're a jerk. No, it's, it's not me. I didn't write it. The Bible says by your stripes you're healed. So then what do I need to do to appropriate that wisdom of God? Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says he is the wisdom of God. So the wisdom of God took stripes for you to live in divine health. So what you need in order to actually live that out is knowledge and understanding. This is imperative when you're reading Proverbs. It's not just, oh, here's a great statement that could go into any secular book of information. No, here's something that God said. Now, what does that mean? In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, most of you can probably quote this, where it says, lean not, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. You know there's a difference between your understanding and God's understanding? <laughs> Man, some of you need to get that. In all your ways acknowledge him. No, 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 God, I got this. You just do that spiritual stuff over there. I'll handle regular life. Hey, God, I'll handle my marriage because I make Kay swoon anyway. All the time. All the time, she says. <laughs> she just lied. <laughs> I'll handle marriage, God. You do the hard things like take care of my eternity. Okay, good luck. Call me when you need counseling, hopefully. Some of the people just avoid the counseling and go right to the divorce court. It, it, you ain't going to do it in your natural strength. If you think two humans are going to live together in divine peace and joy and covenant without God, you have... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not laughing at nobody. But good luck. You'll need it. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And then he will make your path straight. These are the purposes of the Proverbs, is to take us to Jesus, to take us to the Spirit of God. In Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, Proverbs 9, 10, says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I, I know we live in like the age of grace and we're all about the love of God and sloppy agape and greasy grace and and it's all about me and the cool gospel of, of Steve Castle because God loves Steve so much. He's going to do all this great stuff for Steve. And, and this is something that has died a terrible death because of our meistic, self-centered, I, I focused culture and society. We have lost the fear of the Lord. God is infinitely holy. If God manifested himself right here, there'd be dead people. If you don't believe me, read the Bible. God is infinitely holy. And you can tell that a lot of people don't, that doesn't resonate with a majority of Christians because you can tell. When, they're, uh, when the presence of God comes in the room during praise and worship and they're sitting there drinking coffee and picking their nose and cutting their toenails, you think there's fear of God in them? When the anointed word of God is going forth and people are sleeping and drooling on themselves, you think that's the fear of God? Not even a little. There is no fear of God in a wise, underst or there is no lack of the fear of the Lord in a wise and understanding person. We have lost this. Culture has lost this. Honor, reverence, it is gone. It's gone. Now, that doesn't mean that it will never come back. You can revive it. You can bring it into your family. You can bring it into our environment here. You can, you can always renew and awaken the things of God. They never die completely, but they're dead in this culture and their society. If you're expecting to walk out these doors and have somebody honor you, 
have someone value you? You know, when I was a kid, we knew in town who the local clergy was, who the, who the priests were, who the, who the pastors were, and they got infinite amounts of respect and value. If they walked in the grocery store, hello, Father Smith. Hello, Pastor. Good day, isn't it? Yep. When they walked in, when I was a kid learning how to be a, rent, uh, a renter, a mechanic, when the, when the pastor would come in in his broken car, uh, Smitty was the guy that taught me how to wrench. Smitty would jump up. Hello, pastor. Let me fix your car. He'd put everything on the side. He fixed the pastor's car and never charged him. And Smitty was a drunk. A, divor- a, a three-time divorced drunk. Smitty, there wasn't a, there wasn't a rip of Christianity in Smitty, but there was a fear of the Lord. He honored the people of God. And I'm not saying this so you guys can be like, oh, pastor's here. No, because we're, I, it's not, you know there's no hierarchy in beloved church. If you think that I'm super awesome, then you haven't been listening. The hierarchy in the body of Christ is Jesus is the head and we're the body. There's the hierarchy. We're all equal. But the fact that there's just no honor for that, there's no fear of the Lord, then you're not going to really gain the wisdom and the opportunity that the Proverbs, the best practices, give you options for. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 makes this really clear, and I'm not going to go through all these verses, but you know them because the Beatles sang them. Right? Just need a secular musician to sing some songs, and then we'll learn some Bible. To everything there's a season. And a time for every purpose under heaven. Just go to two. And he does this throughout the rest of these eight verses. There's a time to be born and a time to die. There's a time to plant and a time to root. You know what a time to plant is? There's a specific time that when you put seed in the ground, that seed is going to produce. And if you say, well, I'm a man of faith. I'm going out here. God do anything. He's the the impossible making possible God. And you go out in December and chisel a hole in your backyard and put a tomato plant out there. you, You need a V8. And it ain't God that damned your poor little tomato plant. And it ain't the devil that killed your tomato plant. And it's, for crying out loud, it definitely ain't climate change. It was your stupidness. You killed a tomato. You should feel terrible. There's a time to plant, and there's a time to uproot. And if you don't know the difference... Anybody ever done relationships? And you did the right thing at the wrong time? Am I the only one? Somebody needs to bail me out here. (laughs) I have done the right thing with Kay at the wrong time, and it did not turn out to my advantage. And she's super easy and sweet and and gracious, and and she's perfect in every way. And I've done the right thing at the wrong time. And it just wasn't awesome. You know what I should have done? Listen to God. He would have said, hey, that's a great idea, son. Don't you dare do it right now. (laughs) Okay, Dad. Okay, now's the time. Great. Hey, baby. (gasps) That's the most wonderful thing right now at this time that I could have possibly had. You are the greatest husband that God's ever... Sorry. (laughs) Luke 20, verse 8, Jesus operated this exact same way. Jesus replied, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. If you remember the story, they came to him and they tried to challenge him in this way. He said, hey, if um, if you're the son of God, then we need you to do a miracle. And he's like, I'm not playing your reindeer games. And then they said, well, fine. These miracles you've been doing, in whose authority are you doing it? In whose name? Who do you think you are? And then Jesus, in wisdom, says, hmm, I'll tell you what. I'll answer your question. 
You tell me by what authority did John the Baptist do his baptisms? By heaven? Or did he do them on his own power? And it said that they went and they kind of argued back and forth. They say, well, if it's from heaven, then he's going to ask us why we all rejected what John the Baptist was doing. But if we say that it was from earth, then the crowd's going to kill us because the crowd knows that John the Baptist was a prophet sent from God. Darn it. Jesus trapped them in wisdom. Wisdom. Jesus operated in proverbial truths. Proverbs has much to say about fools. They despise wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7, 22, 10, 21, 23, 9. They are, in right, uh, they are right in their own eyes. Man, I'll tell you what. One of, the, one of the biggest ways you can tell whether somebody's operating in foolishness is if they're like, I got this. I'm perfect parenting. I'm perfect spousing. I'm perfect living life. Okay, you are on a train rail to a wreck. They are deceitful, Proverbs 14.8, and scornful, Proverbs 10.23. The wise are also given instruction on how to deal with fools in, in Proverbs. Instructing a fool is pointless because his speech is full of foolishness. And he does not want wisdom and understanding. Proverbs 18.2. Also a fool can even deny the existence of God. Did you know it? There's actually people that think there's no God. That's the epitome of fool. Psalm 14.1. So back to the original question for Jim. God bless you, Jim. Thanks for your question. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he become wise in his own eyes. So what does this mean? This means you need Ecclesiastes chapter 3 in operation. You need to have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, who is the wisdom of God. You need to know what to do in each situation, because there are times that you're supposed to be answering a fool according to his folly and rescuing him from his own ignorance. And there's times you need to shut your face and let them take themselves right off the edge. And when they're within a hair's breadth of dying, then God might have you swoop in and raise them from the dead. And you need to know the difference. There are times that you need to let people experience their own destruction. And then there are times that you are called to stop people from getting into destruction. And if you mess them up and you do them backwards, then you're going to empower a bad person to continue doing evil things. And if you don't rescue the right person, then you didn't have mercy and compassion on the person that God wanted you to rescue. And you need the wisdom of God as to know when. And I'll guarantee you this, it ain't based on your emotions. I don't give a rip what you feel. It is based on the wisdom of God through intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Over to you. Yeah, you pretty much nailed down what I was going to say. So I do not need to add that question. Did, is that recorded? That's, okay. I'm going to cut that out. I'm going to make that my screensaver. You have nailed everything I wanted to say. <laughs> Additionally, real quick for the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is such an amazing book. And I don't have time to get into all this. But it's kind of the dichotomy between the person called wisdom, she is fair and beautiful, and then it's the other person. I, I love the King James because the King James calls her the, uh, uh, man, I can't even remember it. Uh, she's, the, she's the treacherous woman. She's the, the one, the unknown woman. And she obviously plays the part of the mistress and the adulteress and all that kind of stuff. But she's, she's in presence throughout the entire scriptures. And so the book of Proverbs is really about wisdom, which is Jesus, and then anti-wisdom, which is anti-Christ, the enemy. And this plays out throughout the entire, script, the entire book. And in fact, Proverbs 31 is the wisdom of God in a woman. The virtuous woman in Proverbs 31 is the wisdom of God. 
But I just want to real quick, in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, I won't go through these, but this is really important because the Proverbs open up and it says, hey, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, smart dude. And then it lays out the purpose of Proverbs, verses 2 through 7. And here's what it says. It says that it's, these Proverbs are to make the simple wise. So they simple, a simpleton, it used to be a way you could insult someone, a simpleton. Another person that it was talking to was the immature so that's a different category of person. A simpleton and an immature person are two different types of people. And then another person is a fool. And so there's like three categories of the ways that the Proverbs talk about people. The way the Proverbs talk about the immature is going to be, hey, do this to mature them. The way the Proverbs are going to talk about the simple, which simple basically means like ignorant stupid and I, and I know that you're like the Bible would never call anybody stupid oh my god please read it the, but God doesn't damn a person to, to stupidity what God does is God wants to take the stupid and make them wise God wants to take the immature and make them mature and God wants to also deal with the fool and rescue them from their folly but these are kind of uh, like delineations so if a person's simple, they're just stupid, well then God wants to come in and rescue them, he has tons of compassion, and make them wise. If a person's immature, you know, usually immaturity is a choice, and so God's going to kind of deal with them a little bit different. That's kind of like the middle person. And then the fool is the person that's just like straight rebellious to God and uh, completely denying and not operating in the wisdom of God. And so when you're reading through the Proverbs, and the Proverbs says, uh, the simple man does this, but the mature will do this. So now you can categorize those different types of people that the Proverbs are talking about. Immature, simple, and fool. And the ones against the fool are usually pretty, uh, pretty direct and pretty hard because they're fools. And this is why some people, when they're reading the Proverbs, are like, whoa, God's pretty tough. Like, the fool's back needs many stripes. Like, God, are you advocating... Um, whipping a person maybe if they're that foolish maybe the only thing that's going to shake them out of their foolishness is a little bit of warming up on their gluteus, gluteus maximus with a with a rod that will connect to their cerebral cortex so that's why the bible talks about spanking kids sorry we're going to cover Kay and i are going to talk about parenting at one point in this series that is going to be infinitely long at this point. <laughs> Brittany, you have a question. So, Go ahead. So, um, <laughs> I was reading in 1 Samuel 28, and it's right after the prophet Samuel has passed away, and Saul's already had his anointing lifted, and he's chasing David, trying to kill him and then is like oh but you're so righteous and he is starting to see uh, what Samuel has spoken to him about the kingdom taking away from him and the fall of his family like starting to happen and so Saul goes and has requests a meeting with a medium and then the medium like raises up Samuel and then like he's like why are you disturbing me and like gives him the same like word again or reminds of what he said and I I'm like, is this really Samuel he's talking to? Is that really possible back then before they had a relationship? Like, I'm just kind of confused at, like, what's happening and if I'm missing something or looking too much into it. Yeah. Yep. This is the witch of Endor. The, those of you that don't know your Old Testament, you're missing out on a lot of fun. So Saul was in a really terrible spot, and he knew he needed to hear from God, and God wasn't talking. Um, I am not going to unpack that for some of you, but some of the reasons that you think that God is silent with, with you is because he told you what to do and you're not listening and you're looking for a second word from the Lord. You need to go back to the first one. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of quiet. 
Saul didn't want to go back to the first one because the first one meant that he had to be humble and submit himself to what God wanted to do. So he decided to usurp the entire system and went to the witches that were supposed to be dead that he could supposedly all put to death. He just kept a couple for himself. And he went to the witch and he said, Hey, I need you to conjure up Samuel because Samuel is the prophet and Samuel hears from God. And since God ain't talking to me, I need Samuel. And <clears throat> Samuel, man, I, there's, there's a ton of cosmology here that I, I can't really unpack. But he, the, the medium does conjure up the dead. And this is actually Samuel that gets conjured up. And this will throw you off those of you that don't really understand how to parse out the scriptures, Samuel was, uh, was said in here to be an Elohim. And for those of that struggle with that, if you've even heard that term, you've heard that Elohim means God, big G God. And that's not true. Elohim means of the God classification, of the spirit world. So anything in the spirit world is an Elohim, but none of the Elohim is our God. God is an Elohim, but there is no Elohim like our God. God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So Samuel was an Elohim because he was disembodied. And <clears throat> before Jesus rent hell and took the keys of hell and death, there was basically a two-tiered Sheol that existed in ancient Israeli cosmology. And that two-tiered Sheol was called Abraham's bosom. If you've ever read Luke chapter 16, Jesus called it Abraham's bosom. And basically, there were the unrighteous dead in one part and the righteous dead in another part. <clears throat> and they were real people. They weren't fakesies. And... This witch of Endor used her, her training from demonic spirits. Demo, uh, demonic entities will train you how to do demonic things. And she was trained by demonic entities how to conjure up the dead. And so she conjured up Samuel. And as you can tell, Samuel wasn't super happy about this. If you read the story later on, he, and he ends up basically re-damning Saul. He gave him the same word that God gave him. The word didn't change just because it came from a different person. And it, it obviously turned out terrible for Saul. One of the differences between Saul and David, some people I know struggle with this, because Saul comparatively was much more moral than David. And yet God rent the kingdom from Saul and none of his posterity had any right to have any inclusion whatsoever in the dynastic flow of the Messiah. Whereas David was a scoundrel. The dude was just bad on multiple occasions on multiple levels. Hooking up with his best friend's wife because he was awake at night when he should have been sleeping. He was supposed to be out to war and he was chilling at his palace being all rich and I can do anything I want. Stole his neighbor's wife. Killed his neighbor, which was one of his best friends. And then the baby ended up dying because it was conceived in sin and did all kinds of terrible stuff. And David was the, in the lineage of Jesus. And Jesus was called the son of David. Like, what the heck? How did God say that David's a man after my own heart? And the only thing that Saul did was he didn't wait long enough to do the sacrifices that Samuel told him to sacrifice. And then he tried to conjure up the dead. Like, okay, I get it. It's bad. But you, this dude had an adulterous affair and murdered his friend. So what's the difference between David and Saul? The difference between David and Saul is David never, ever, ever lost his allegiance to Yahweh and Yahweh alone. He was a one God man. He didn't do it well, but he was a one God man. Saul, he went after whatever God would give him whatever he wants. Apply that to your Christianity. Should give you a shiver. Because we do this. God is my God. Except for my job, because that's the God of my money. And my 
porn addiction, which is the god of my sexuality, and my gender ideology, which is the god of my personality, and my, and my, and my, and my, but God is my god. Okay. And so this uh, is actually Samuel. Now the difference is, is that now that Sheol has been redefined because of what Jesus did, Jesus went down to hell and broke hell. I, I don't know how else to say that. He broke it. There is no, there is no longer any uh, righteous in Sheol. The righteous are in the presence of God, with God. And so, any current phase, so this is Old Testament, conjure up somebody from the dead. New Testament is, you can't do that. You can conjure up the, you can conjure up demons that have learned how to mimic the personality of dead people. And the Bible calls them, in the New Testament, they're called familiar spirits. And so if you were to go to a medium or a palm reader or one of those crazies that are out there, and you say, hey, I want to I wanna get my future from my great uncle who passed away, who I love the most, she will conjure up a demon that is per perpetuating themselves, purporting themselves to be your great uncle. Will speak with his voice, will take his image, and will say things about you that only your great uncle could know. This has happened. I can give you names and phone numbers of people that this has happened to. And they went down a demonic trail that only by the grace of God they got rescued. Because these demons are good. You open yourself up like that, you are going to get ravaged by the gates of hell. And so you can conjure up familiar spirits in your life today. I, obviously, I'm encouraging you to stay as far away from that as possible, but it happens. So if you ever hear somebody went to a, a medium and they said, well, this medium like literally had information that there was no possible way anybody else could have ever known because this spirit that was my, my family member told them these things. Yep, completely agreement, agree it, uh, uh, agree with it. That doesn't mean it's God. It doesn't mean it's right. There's a spiritual force that's dark, and there's a spiritual force that's light. And the dark spirits, you know, Satan per, uh, will sometimes um, manifest himself as an angel of light. You know how many times people have been fooled by that kind of stuff? Well, this has got to be good because it looks good. It's an angel and it glows. It's got to be good. No, not everything that glitters is gold. The, if you do not have the discernment of the Spirit, the enemy's got more tricks up his... He's been deceiving people for 6,000 years, tens of billions of people, and if you think you're going to go head-to-head -head and beat him, you are a fool. A fool. It takes discernment of the Spirit to conquer that kind of deception. Yeah, I knew you were going to pack most of that yourself, but uh, I, I was just thinking as you were talking how... Like, there's nothing new. And yeah. yet, you know, the Bible clearly states not to engage in those kind of things. And yet, because we have such a Bible illiterate generation, they seek for answers in the worst places possible and open the door to things that they... they um, don't realize they're doing because of their ignorance, because God is trying to show us through his word what to steer clear from, what to stay away from, to seek him for everything that we need. And the end result is there's, you know, there's mediums in every little town now. Yep. There's one in Freeport. Two. Because we have just not honored his word and his instruction in our lives. that answer your question good that's those are that's a good question those are verses that scholars have wrestled with for a long time miss alex i don't know how to word my question really but so i hope you can follow me <laughs> i have a person in my life who um they disagree with christianity because of how they see 
how it works. And you've like taught on this so much, but I'm like trying to find a good way to explain it to them. So I'm like, I'll just have them listen to Steve answer it. <laughs> uh -huh. So he doesn't understand why we all have to pay for what Eve did. It, like the garden, it was perfect. God was there. <clears throat> yes, we have free will. But you know what I mean? There's just like, for me, there's this gap also. Of, I, I can't explain that to you. Like it's above my head a little saying, bit too. Are you asking why Jesus had to pay for the failures of humanity? Sort of, because we'll bring that up, but then it's like, he did that, so we can walk in the fullness of God, but for people who don't even quite grasp that, it's like, why would a, a loving, perfect God have Kill his son. Eve and Adam and, and then have sin be able to happen and then have to have, sin, have to send Jesus, and then we're all still living in this fallen place unless yep. you do a, try to live in that fullness which we all struggle to do. Yeah, so there's two facets to this. So one of them is atonement. So why did the atonement have to go down the way it did? Which um, I would, I'm honestly just going to re reference you to, uh, to Expedition 44, Doc, Doc, uh, Doc Ryan and, and Dr. Matt uh, did, I think, eight or nine different uh, hour and a quarter long messages on different atonement theories. And I can kind of synopsize the whole thing by saying that both them and I believe that the main atonement theory is Christus Victus, which just means that Jesus defeated every single thing that the enemy did. One of the atonement theories that we're not, I agree with them that I do not um, hold to is what's called PSA, which is penal substitution atonement, which means I was guilty, I was a terrible person, so God killed Jesus. That's, that's penal substitution, and that is not a workable atonement theory. I'm just going to be honest with you. In fact, it says in Ezekiel chapter 16, I think it's Ezekiel 16. I'd have to look it up real quick. But Ezekiel 16 says that the soul that sins, that's the soul that shall die. So then how does God say, oh, well, Jesus didn't sin, but he's going to die for the sin. So if you, if you really work that out, there's a problem with a lot of people's atonement theories because they're going to say, well, Jesus didn't sin, but he died for my sins. And there is a reality that he died for our sins, but he didn't die for the, the sins of you in the way that he's getting penalized for your sin. God didn't say, well, you know, what kind of a father? I mean, if you really think about it, there's a lot of validity to the people that question this. Because what kind of a father says, I infinitely love you, Rebecca. You're my favorite. I love you the most. And so I'm going to kill Jesus. Well, do you love Jesus? I love him the mostest, mostest. But you're going to kill him for me? So a lot of our atonement theories are just really jacked up. One thing is God didn't kill Jesus. God's not a killer. And a lot of people's atonement theory has God killing Jesus. That's not what happened. <laughs> it, and I, I cannot honestly unpack all the atonement theories, but I can tell you that if you don't get your atonement understanding proper, you're going to have God as a murderer and Jesus as a penal substitution for all of us. And that is not the case. Jesus, of his own volition, of his love for us, destroyed death and sin as a work of God. He did that. And the way that he did that was to have to submit himself to sin and death. He did that, and because he did that, he destroyed sin and death. So Jesus was victorious over sin and death because he willingly humbled himself, made himself of no reputation, this, this, these famous verses in Philippians 2, and um, submitted himself to the death, even the death of the cross, 
so that we could be redeemed from, by him. And so having your atonement theory proper is going to release God from humanity thinking that he's just some evil dude that decided to kill his son one day. Like, well, humans are so bad. And I love them so much that Jesus, I'm going to kill you. And like Jesus was like, okay, that's fine. God, I love you back. Kind of. <laughs> like, I mean, you'd struggle with that. So then um, the second part of the question is really kind of a bigger, more philosophical question is, so where did the evil come from in the garden? And then if Jesus beat all that, then why is there still evil? And the simplest way to answer that is because God, in wanting to have legitimate relationship with humanity, a loving, legitimate relationship with us, had to, by default, give us free will. There is no such thing as, as love without free will. A lot of parents that think their kids love them, they don't love them. They're just acting right so they don't get in trouble. And there's a lot of this that happens in Christianity that we really think that we're loving. And it's not. We're just like, I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to sing the songs. I'm going to be moral. because I'm going to... It's not really love. God gave us free will so that we, of our own desires, of our own will, would choose to love him. And if an Adam and Eve did not have them, did not have the same opportunity at choice and will, then they were not truly capable of living in a loving relationship with God. And God wanted a loving relationship, so by default, they had permission to choose against God. And the same way it was in the garden is the same way that it is now. Because there are people that are choosing against God's will, there is evil on this planet. Now some of them are doing it directly and some of them are doing it indirectly, but irrelevant to how the effects are. It is causing there to be tons of evil on our planet. God has zero to do with the reason that evil is here other than making the capacity for people to choose right, wrong, evil, or good. That is why there's evil here. The only way to get rid of evil in the world is for everybody to die. Because even some of us, as good as we are, and that's going to land differently in different of your heads. But as good as we are, us, we, are all capable of evil. We could probably filter back over the last seven days and there might be something that you'd say, yeah, it's pretty evil. That was, that was just evil. And so because we're capable of evil, there's going to be evil. But because we're capable of goodness, love, grace, mercy, the Holy Spirit, there is also the same equal potential for this planet to be amazing. God has zero to do with the evil that's on this planet. He didn't create it. He didn't will it to be. He didn't uh, have some divine plan that was just going to torture billions and billions of people in an evil world, and then he's going to come in and try to rescue us in the very, very end. And he says, that's not the way God is. He doesn't think that way. He's not that way. He is good, all good. He is love, all love. And because of that, we made a terrible choice in the garden, and we've been making terrible choices ever since against God's will. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Thing too, it just boils down to choices. Adam and Eve had a choice in the garden, and they just chose the wrong thing. Um, so even us, if we got placed into the garden, we still have the same potential that Adam and Eve did to make the wrong choice, and then we're guilty. So it, you know, I don't. Um, I I know and environment's important so like, I'm not going to say like you know that it is not but even even Adam and Eve in the perfect environment still had the capacity within them to um, make the wrong choice and so you know implying that well if, if God would just give me the per if we were just back in the Garden of Eden 
You know, if God, God would just do that for us, everything would be great and awesome. You need to go back to the book of Genesis and read that again. If I had the perfect pastor, if I was in the perfect church, if I had the perfect spouse, everything would be perfect. Really? Judas had the perfect pastor and the perfect church. I mean, it's, it, it doesn't work that way. Everything will eventually come down to your choice. And you are tempted in all points like every other human being has ever been tempted. So why do some people... Uh, why are some people successful in temptations and other people not? Some people live closer to the one that gives them the victory than others. <clears throat> Everybody in here is tempted with the same stuff. I have the capacity to do any amount of evil that any other human has done. What's the difference? I'm choosing with my will to do different things with my life, with my mentality. That's good. Now, I know somebody might be thinking, and don't you turn in the question now, you might be thinking like, well, what about heaven? Are we going to have opportunity to be evil? And my simple answer is no, because the, temp the possibility for temptation has been removed because everybody in heaven has going to have already been tempted. So there doesn't need to be further temptation for you to continue in a loving relationship, an authentically loving relationship with God because you have been tempted, you don't need to continue to be tempted. So heaven will not have temptation, so there will not be a third or a fourth or a 17th fall. There's not gonna be more falls. It's going to be sorted. Now God deep into theology, so if you got questions about that, send me an email. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering about um, Ephesians 1, 4, and 5, where he chose us before the foundation of the world. Does that mean, like, he chose Steve in particular and Sarah and whatever? Or does it mean the concept of he is going to choose people throughout time to do his purpose and work? Yep, this is a... <clears throat> this is a big conversation on uh, what's commonly referred to as predestination. Predestination is a, is a theological term that gets into this great big wide conversation. In fact, in verse 5 it says, he, he predestined us. And it's, it's almost that same word in every single translation of the scripture. And this word was only used here and um, in Romans. Romans chapter 8. Um, it was used one time in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 7, but it was used in a different context. And it's used one time in Acts chapter 4, but it's talking about uh, choices. It's not talking about people. And so basically, the, the three big verses are Romans 8.29, Romans 8.30, and Ephesians 1.5, which deals with the doctrine of predestination. And so I'll just do this super duper quick. I can give you tons and tons of of scholarly work and, and verse references and all that to go with this. But what predestination means is that God, the people that have accepted the call of God are predestined to get to the end of what God intended for them to be. If I have placed my faith in God, if I have answered the call, the calling, and I have been elected or selected, <clears throat> then I am going to be conformed to the image of God. Obviously, if I maintain my faith. And so the doctrine of predestination is not about God pre-choosing who he's destined for heaven or hell. It's about God pre-choosing that those that answer his call will be conformed to Christ. So predestination doesn't mean that be, you know, when, when Hannah and Gunner were in Kay's womb, God was like, I don't know. Do I want these kids to go to heaven or hell? It, it, it's not that. And there's a lot of denominations. I know you think that's funny, but there's a lot of denominations that believe that. That people were born destined for hell and people that were born destined for heaven. That's not the case. Now, does God know? Of course, God knows everything. But you're talking about a trillion choices between here and there. 
So there's a lot of options for people. I honestly believe that Jesus was working to try to bring Judas into redemption. But Judas just kept choosing to go the way that he went. And so even somebody like Judas, Judas who had prophetic, a prophetic reality to how his life ended, that he was the son of perdition that was destined for damnation, that um, Jesus knew that. But I do, not, I do not believe that Jesus said, oh, well, you're going to hell anyway. I mean, he gave him his name, and Judas did miracles and, and was intimately with Jesus and probably shared deep, deep, deep conversations with him. And, the, and we know that the Lord loved him, washed his feet in love. Why would you do that if you're just like, oh, you're damned anyway, you're going to hell? That, that is not the doctrine of predestination. It's been made into that because these verses have been twisted, but that is not what these verses are saying. We are... Um, because we've answered the call to sonship, we will be full-grown, mature sons and daughters of God because we've answered that call. That is our predestination because of our response. And I can give, I know that is real quick, um, but there's a ton and ton of verses that I can give you and, and uh, scholarly works that'll prove everything I just said, except take a lot longer to get there. Uh, and two, for me, on, on this verse that he has chosen us, it, it is his will. Like, he chose it, because God has his own free will. He's bound by his word, but he chooses what he speaks. He chooses what he has set in place um, for how, you know, the kingdom is supposed to operate and how heaven is supposed to operate. Um, and so it is his will that everyone be holy and without blame before him in love. That, that is his will, that is desire, that is his choice. That before the foundation of the world, that was one of the things that he wanted to set in place as he was, um, I don't want to say planning out creation. I don't know if there's a better way to say that. But that was his desire for everyone. And he wanted to be in fellowship with everyone. And for us to be in fellowship with him, we need to be holy. We need to be blameless. We need to be, you know, walk before him in love. And so that's just kind of my little simple synopsis of this verse, is that it was his will for everyone to be in relationship with him. Uh, a quick way to really get this is a sunflower seed is predestined to be a sunflower. And sometimes a sunflower seed gets in my belly. <laughs> and it never fulfills its predestined purpose or intention. And so when we're born again, the seed of the living word of God, the imperishable seed of the living word of God has created you to be the full grown. And so as long as we stay in faith and we give that seed permission to do what's it, it's already been pre-programmed, predestined, DNA, uh, genetically proven by God that that seed is going to turn into a full-grown son or daughter of God. But every once in a while, there's a believer that ends up in the belly of a demon, ends up in the dragon's belly. They were predestined to be conformed to the image of God, and something happened. And notice that it, it also has the, real, the uh, language about adoption. And adoption is much different than natural birth, now, adoption in their culture had a much higher regard than a natural born child. In Greco-Roman um, understanding, a natural born child could be given up. If you had a natural born child as a Roman citizen and they weren't performing to the level that you wanted them to perform, you could literally um, cut them out of your family and they'd become homeless, nameless, and worthless. But if you ever adopted someone in Roman, in that culture, you could not ever let them go. They would be a full son because you chose to bring them into your name. They will always be a castle, no matter what their performances, no matter what they do. Once they've been adopted, they are secured in that place. And so notice that the predestination language here is associated with the adoption language. Not natural birth language, but adoption language. 
And so we've been adopted because we've answered the call. God called us and said, hey, I'd like to adopt you into my family instead of Satan's family. And we said, that's awesome. That sounds like good news. And when you came in, then you received that imperishable seed of the word of God that is going, that was predestined to conform you into the image of Christ. So you're going to get there as long as you believe. And some of you are thinking, man, I've been trying for a long. Okay, hang in there, kitty. You're going to get there. All right, that's as much as we got. I know some of you emailed some questions and all that, and um, I'll talk to Kay about how we're going to do this, but I've got tons of answers for those questions. A lot of it has to do with demonology. Is that exciting to anybody? You guys want to learn something about some demons? Um, and so I got a lot on that. And then we also have a question on capital punishment. That's a great question. These are really good questions. I am so, I am so honored and excited about uh, how much um, the spiritual awareness of our room is, is really developed um, from the beginning. And so I'm, I'm really excited to get into some of these. So I'll talk to Kay about how we want to do this and maybe um, either her and I or just me will come up and answer some of these questions. So we, I promise we're going to get to all your questions, but because sometimes Kay's so long-winded, we can't. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. She's trying to get better. We talk all the time about it. I'm like, baby. All right, so please rise. I'd like to bless you. Please receive the blessing that the Father has for you. He calls you beloved, the ones that are greatly loved. And we, he and I both desire that you experience prosperity and his type of divine health. And the way this happens is by allowing your soul to prosper through intimacy with him and knowledge of his word. I love you and I'll see you again soon.